thank you so much for coming. This is exciting. It's such an honor to be part of the Speakeasy, be part of Wanderlust. It's my first time ever here. It's probably my first presentation as well, but we won't go too far into that. <laughs> but um, I'm really excited to see all your faces, and it's been a great uh, first day for me here. It's so beautiful. I did an amazing yoga class. I hiked up a mountain. Like, how much better can you get? I hope you guys have all had a good day as well. And maybe some of you were here yesterday. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to get started by introducing myself and then the topic, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into some stuff. And then we'll end on um, some kind of togetherness, improvisation, and, and violin performance stuff. So my name is Sarah Neufeld. I, um, I'm a violinist, and I also teach yoga, practice yoga, and I co-own um, a studio in New York City called Moksha Yoga New York. And um, I'm in a couple bands, primarily the Arcade Fire. Um, Bell Arcast is a group I co-founded ages ago. And so I've got all these, these, uh, these things going on. Um, I recently started a solo uh, project that's just under my name, and it's, um, it's original compositions um, on the violin, which I'll be performing tomorrow night, actually, at 8 o'clock on the main stage. So they asked me to come up with a topic of something that I was thinking about and interested in, in talking about, and um, kind of the intersection of the yogic practices and the creative path is something I'm really interested in, and I kind of am constantly living it and working with it. And uh, I think it's an interesting discussion, so we'll get into some more Q&A stuff later. But um, open ears, open mind, that's the title of my presentation. And what I'm going to be focusing on is practice in of itself and, and how two really important pillars of practice, and even the definition of practice could be taken literally as, in the yogic teachings, abhyasa and vairagya. Abhyasa, kind of sustained effort, consistent practice. Varagya, the letting go or the surrendering, the non-attachment. And so this concept to me is really paramount in the intersection of the yogic practices and creativity. And, um, and in that of itself, this practice of just constantly sustaining that and then learning how to practice all of that, really, with equanimity. Um, so my path to all this stuff, five years ago, I actually started preparing a mini version of this presentation. And I was really focused on the idea that there was a profound link between meditation and improvisation. And um, I was preparing this mini presentation, five minutes, <laughs> for my teacher training that I did about four and a half, five years ago. <clears throat> and I was really, really excited about all this. I mean, I was young in my practice, I was young in my meditation practice, and I was getting ready for a teacher training, super wet behind the ears. So I was really putting together all these ideas um, in a really like young, excited, naive, but awesome way. And so I was leaning into this feeling that I, touched on um, while I would sometimes meditate, because I really didn't have it together on a daily basis then, I was tapping into this feeling that I also knew deeply from improvisation. So this really open, expansive awareness. Um, and that was exciting for me, because on the rare instance that I was able to sit and watch my breath, I came into that similar headspace that I knew from improvising. And I knew that from improvising, that's so important. If you're busy caught up in yourself or thinking about where you want this to go or how you want it to turn out, you're totally not improvising and you're not listening. And especially with other people. When you're improvising with other people, it's such an incredible chance to completely let go of all your, all your perceived notions about what this should be. And so to me, that was really the link 
I felt like an aha moment at that point because I had so much more experience with improvising than with meditation, but I felt like, oh my God, this is the same thing. And yet, I wasn't really practicing meditation. I was really practicing asana. Like a lot of us, I think, in the West really jump into asana practice and like we really go for it. I was really focused on that feeling and in focusing on the feeling, I was really focusing on the outcome. So when you look at meditation, um, not as a practice or a, a process or a path, but as like, what do I want to get out of this? I want that spaciousness. I want that quality of open awareness, right? So I was really focused on the outcome, which is really, really normal for somebody young in their practice. I noticed a difference with my relationship, even then, um, to music, because I'd been at it for so long. So I started playing the violin when I was three. I was one of those eager whippersnappers. I had a big brother, and he played. But I just was really drawn to it, honestly. I remember that feeling of, of just really wanting to play, and I was three years old. I don't understand that, but I really wanted to play, and I started, and I, I stuck with it for a long time. Um, and I think when you have the history with something, you don't necessarily uh, approach it outcome-based. Like, I didn't start violin when I was three thinking, this is going to make me a better person, I'm going to move through life in this way, or, or I'm going to, like, you know, become more artistic or more creative. I didn't have that endeavor um, behind it. So uh, I was always really, really into improvisation, like I've probably already said a hundred times in the last five minutes. But as a classical violinist, that was kind of a tough um, balance. The path of a classical musician, you're really supposed to be uh, working on repertoire and uh, spitting out that repertoire in a, in a very beautiful, very precise fashion. And maybe you have your own voice, but that's not really the the um the thing so it was hard for me because i really just wanted to lock myself in a room and play my ideas and so i kind of struggled back and forth with it all the while gaining a little proficiency because i started when i was three and then i quit <laughs> when i was 15. so uh i couldn't deal with that um the sort of demand of that classical rigor i was getting uh into my musical heroes at that point and they weren't uh, concert violinists, they were Jimi Hendrix, and they were Bob Marley and the Pixies. And so I picked up the guitar, and you know, when you're a teenager, you want to be in a rock band, and I started that whole thing. And it was so much fun, it was such a different, raw, free expression. And uh, I did, however, keep playing violin, and that became really this improvisation-based activity, pretty much alone, just, exploring my ideas. And uh, at that time, my favorite, my favorite connection to music, even while I was kind of exploring the, the high school band thing, was uh, I would get my big brother's friends to sit on the couch and tell me a mood or a color or a feeling, and then I would just play it for them for a long time. And so that was, you know, my favorite thing to do. And so it kind of dawned on me that I could, I could link those two up. So I stuck a pickup on the violin and I kind of pushed it into the band and I thought that this was exciting and I wanted to go further. And I was 15 and I didn't know anything about like rock bands not necessarily having violins in them or was this a cool thing to do or not. Like I grew up on an island, I didn't know it was cool. Um, <laughs> it probably didn't matter. So. Uh, I moved to the East Coast. I was really inspired by the work that was going on there with Godspeed, You Black Emperor, and all this like really intense, dark, instrumental post-rock music. You guys know that band? Yeah, okay. So, I, yeah. I got out of the West Coast funk zone, and I got into the East Coast, and I started um, studying music at university, but in a much more open, open, dynamic way. I was studying electroacoustics, which I majored in. I was studying jazz because I wanted to bend my ear around um, different, different modalities, not playing strictly major minor, uh, but playing mod modally, which is intense when you're coming from classical music. And I also studied composition. And all that stuff was kind of gelling with the people that I met and we all started this collaborative 
um, ensemble called Bel Orchestre, which the whole kind of point of it was um, group improvisation leading to through composed music informed by movement. <laughs> so that was really an exciting thing to be working with. It took forever. Um, what a process, five people or then later six people or maybe even seven group improvising together and then just chipping away to find these formed ideas and that all this stuff was happening around dance, theater, film. And then we became kind of a real band and started making records. And this was in the early 2000s and Montreal is a very small community. Um, there's some Montrealers here today, they know what I'm talking about. Everybody kind of knows every, everybody else and everybody practices in each other's jam spaces and that's how I ended up in Arcade Fire. We, there was a bunch of similar members. And then this kind of explosion happened which was super exciting. Uh, just getting swept up in the, in the motion forward with the early days of this rock band, getting it together and making the first record and then all of a sudden we were on tour for years. And uh, we were not, not able to sustain the consistency of this other creativity-based project. And so I kind of lost that, which didn't really matter because when you've got something that bright and that exciting and that inspiring, you kind of don't sit there and complain, well, but I'm not improvising very much and I'm not, <laughs> where are my weird music friends? Um, so I did, however, notice that that gulf was happening um, within my kind of creative self. And right around that time, and this is quite common, people start to discover yoga when they feel like something's missing. Right, and so I was really hungry for probably that connection, a connection to myself or my own kind of voice or authenticity, and I dove into a yoga practice. Um, started doing asana a lot, and a couple years later, I studied for teacher training, and then um, I started teaching in Montreal at Moksha. And this was all, all these ideas were starting to kind of come back into the foreground as I would hear my own voice telling everybody in the room, you know, live mindfully, um, be your own true self, learn how to take care of your body, learn how to take care of your whole self. So I started to kind of feel like, oh, I'm, there's something missing here that I'm, I'm not doing. I'm not uh, expressing myself in, in a way that's important to me. And so, as all this stuff kind of was, was going around, we were still touring for years and years and years, uh, I started writing by myself. I started kind of like, okay, let's put my money where my mouth is. <laughs> let's take these yogic teachings and apply it to me. And uh, so I started writing by myself, pretty much on the road with Arcade Fire on the last cycle. And, um, I started practicing again. <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned, but I'd gotten super lazy. You know when you get pretty good at something and there's that whole super true theory of 10,000 hours? I think I'd had 10,000 hours and I was like, okay, I, can do, I got this. So I never practice. Um, but I started writing my own ideas and they were really hard and my hands would go numb and my body would hurt. And I said, okay, well, I don't have this. I need to practice. And then I started really practicing every day, like I practice asana, like I started really practicing meditation and pranayama. And I thought, wow, this is insane that uh, I haven't had daily practice in a musical way be that focal. And um, so obvious, right? Daily practice. You practice all the things you need to practice to make, to make it right. So I started practicing every day and uh, I started to feel um, something really beautiful unfolding. As in, it, it, as it had with my asana practice and it was starting to with practicing mindfulness and pranayama every day, you really start to feel things unfold. And I was feeling uh, with the daily practice of my violin technique again, a roadmap was forming to my compositional ideas and more than that, 
doing something alone for the first time, I was gaining kind of the wherewithal to follow through on the ideas, to finish pieces, to finish a body of work um, all by myself with no support, and to make an album. And so all this was happening because of practice, because practice builds on itself. So the more you practice, the more you want to practice, the easier it gets, and you keep practicing. And so, you know, it's really easy to also fall out of your practice. But I just um, felt so much nourishment and benefit from actually just finding that dedication to the practice. And I think that I'm, now I'm full circle right back to the fact that my personal feeling of the intersection of the creative path and uh, the yogic practices is kind of one and the same. It's, it's a, a balance of that consistent effort. And then letting go of the outcome, surrendering to what is, so that you can actually really create authentic, exciting work. In improvisation specifically, because that's kind of where I come from, that constant letting go, or the vairagya, is totally um, necessary to create authentic work, to be present in your improvisation. Letting go of your perceived notions and just actually listening and let that guide your notes, guide your next move. So whether it's music, whether it's visual art, whether it's whatever you're actually doing, to really open up and to be receptive to what's going on around you. And it sounds exactly like a yoga class, right? How many times have you heard your yoga teacher tell you to, you know, notice what's coming up, let go of it, breathe into the experience and tune into the experience so that you can really start to get to know yourself and live with that full awareness. So then the motto comes back to not too tight, not too loose, because you can't be a total, um, you can't hold it rigidly. You can't wake up every morning and say like, I'm an artist, I have to do this, I have to do my artist pages, and then I have to do my scales, and then I have to do my, oh, my, my asana, and then my meditation. Like, you have to also be nice to yourself, and so that's part of the letting go. And so now I'm going to ask you guys, how many of you have um, creative pursuits, creative endeavors? Yeah, a lot of you. How many of you guys do yoga and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, wanderlust, right? Um, how many of the creative types feel that sometimes it's somehow more accessible or easier to engage in your yoga practice than your creative practice. Yeah. And then how about the opposite? Like you're really stuck in your head and you want to get to the class and you know that it's going to benefit you and it's going to benefit your creative practice, but you can't get there. You can't get out of your head. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, because I've definitely gone both ways. In getting really obsessed with a project, you can really lose your practice, your asana, your meditation practice, because you know you go down the wormhole, which is good sometimes. Um, so that was kind of my, my, my little story and my expounding on this topic. So what I was thinking um, is to all kind of sit and find your comfortable seat. And I don't know if you've ever done, the, you've probably all done a sea of ohms before. It's where you, you make that sound, ohm, and then you don't worry about when you do it again. So we're, we're ohming into kind of a collective improvisation of ohms. But then I'm also going to start to play out of it. And so it's all of our, it's all of our jobs to Listen, trying to listen with your super open field of awareness. And we'll, we'll, we'll get settled and allow that to happen. It's not like just like, go jump into your open field of awareness. But we'll get settled. And then we'll start to ohm. It's going to die out naturally. So notice, notice when you want to stop or want to push it and just try to let what you're hearing and what you're experiencing be your guide. And I'm going to do that too. I'm not going to prescribe it and say like, here's where I'm going to start playing because it's going to be awesome right now. I'm really going to try to let it happen. So we're going to kind of put that concept into, um, into action. 
Right, so is, is everybody comfortable? This, this is going to last 10, 15 minutes or something. I'm going to sit on this chair. Okay, so find your seat and then root down into it. Close your eyes and let your spine be tall. Okay, support your sitting body with the length of your spine. And find your breath. Notice how the breath feels after all this sitting and listening. Try to breathe really deep and long in and out through your nose. Notice if there's any tension uh, holding in the body, if your shoulders are rounding forward. Take a deep inhale to open the chest and sit up a little bit taller and at the same time settle down in your seat, ground down. Let's breathe together, deep inhale. Long exhale. And again, inhale. Exhale. Next exhale, we start the sea of ohms. Inhale.
and let your breath return to normal, natural. And I hope you all find beautiful, creative gardens in your lives. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me. Uh, namaste.